Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus this Thanksgiving Eve. Please be seated. The giver, the gift, and the response. Tonight, for our Thanksgiving Eve service, I'd like to focus our attention on those three things, the giver, the gift, and the response. We actually see all three present in our prayer of the day that we prayed right before our readings. You have that prayer of the day in your bulletin as well. And I'd like to focus on these three things, the giver, the gift, and the response, as we preach our Thanksgiving display that we have here in our sanctuary, in our chancel, right next to our altar. I'm going to suggest that what we see most of all in this display, the Thanksgiving display, is a picture of praise and thanksgiving to our triune God for all, for providing for all of our needs of body and soul. And seeing this Thanksgiving display once again as we're gathered here in worship on this Thanksgiving Eve, and seeing it that we are encouraged in Christ and sent forth, to respond in praise and thanksgiving. Praise God, from whom all blessings flow. At the top of the banner there, above our thanksgiving display, you have those words, praise God, from whom all blessings flow. The top of the banner, there's also a hand, the hand of God the Father, the Holy Spirit, the dove right in the middle, and the Son depicted there with the cross, And, of course, the cross taking up the main part of the banner. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. There, the cross in the center, the center of our salvation, the focal point of our blessings from God, the great reason for our praise and thanksgiving. And, boy, do the blessings flow, don't they, in this Thanksgiving display. As I understand it, the items for our annual Thanksgiving display typically come from different congregation members. What a wonderful thing, right? An opportunity for different congregation members for, uh, to contribute out of their and to show uh, gratitude and thanksgiving and to contribute out of their abundance to be able to express thanksgiving and praise to God for his provision. And of course, the sacrifice of time by a select few members that sacrifice their time every year to arrange the display, to organize it, so that we have it here in our sanctuary to enhance our worship, to enhance a service like our Thanksgiving service. And the blessings do flow, don't they? You see grapes and apples and wheat and corn, all different varieties of squash, a reminder that all good gifts do come from God above, a reminder that we give thanks to God for the harvest, a reminder that food is one of our basic necessities in life. And then in the middle, the middle of the display, the manger with the cross behind it, And in place of the baby in the manger is a chalice filled with grapes, a loaf of bread, wheat, a Bible, a baptismal shell, God present for us here and now, and word and sacrament, the gospel present for us in Jesus. So the full picture of this Thanksgiving display is one of praise to God for providing for all our needs of body and soul, needs that are centered in the gift of the Son. Quite a display of things for which we are so privileged to express thanks. And that brings us then to the response. We said at the beginning of the sermon that we would focus our attention on three things, the giver, the gift, and the response. The response. If you're like me, that's the toughest part. Or at least offering a response of thanksgiving. In our Old Testament reading, 
We see this great catalog of the Lord's gifts and provision for the people of Israel as they wander in the wilderness. Moses, he points them in our reading to the Lord's promise to give them a good land, a land flowing with water, and the list goes on, fountains and brooks, a land of wheat and barley, of vines and fig trees and pomegranates, a land of olive trees and honey, a land in which they will eat bread, he says, without scarcity and lack nothing, a land where they will eat and be full. Boy, do the blessings flow. And with his Holy Spirit-inspired words, Moses presents a display that shows our triune God providing for the needs of body and soul for the children of Israel. But then in the very next verse, we actually don't have this verse, but if you were reading this in the Bible and you see there, you're reading Deuteronomy chapter 8, verses 1 through 10, when you get to verse 11, you read about the forgetfulness the forgetfulness of the people. Take care, Moses says in the very next verse, verse 11, lest you forget the Lord your God by not keeping his commandments, his rules, his statutes. Lest when you have eaten and are full, he says, and have built good houses and live in them, and when your herds and flocks multiply and your silver and gold is multiplied, and that you, when all that you have is multiplied, then your heart be lifted up and you forget the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. Forgetfulness. That seems to be the more likely response for God's people then and maybe now as well. Forgetfulness in place of thankfulness. Forgetfulness maybe regarding the Lord's bountiful goodness toward us, forgetting to thank God, forgetting and not thanking the one we ought, forgetfulness regarding the mercies of the Lord, which are new every morning, as our prayer puts it, forgetfulness regarding all the Lord's gifts, forgetfulness regarding the giver. And when you've forgotten the giver, how easy it is to take the gifts for granted to slip into a pattern of forgetfulness. And so at the center of the life of the people of Israel seemed to be forgetfulness, at least in this picture that Moses gives to us. Perhaps that's our struggle as well. But God, God places in the center of his people in the Old Testament forgiveness. A tent of meeting, a tabernacle, the sacrificial system, a place where sins could be atoned, sacrifices of thanksgiving could be offered, and it all then pointed forward. It all then pointed to Jesus, the Lamb of God, the great sacrifice, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And so where the forgetfulness of the people and the sin of the people persists, God brings a manger and a cross, and an empty tomb. God sends his son. God purchases forgiveness. God delivers forgiveness. That's the overwhelming message in our Thanksgiving display here in our sanctuary. At least that's what I see. Forgiveness of sins purchased and delivered. It's in the middle, in the middle of all the blessings most important. From it, all blessings flow. It's in the middle of all the gifts, in the middle of all the things for which we can be so very forgetful. So there it is, God's greatest gift, grace, purchased and won on the cross and through our risen Lord and Savior, delivered in word and sacrament, a chalice filled with the fruit of the vine, bread made of many grains, a shell used to give life, giving water, and the living spirit-filled word of God, the Holy Bible. Forgiveness purchased and delivered in the middle where forgetfulness often persists. And what an opportunity some of you have had these past few weeks to kneel here at this altar 
right in front of the thanksgiving display to receive forgiveness. Forgiveness from your Lord and His holy supper. For the mercies that are new every morning, for the gracious gifts of body and soul, it is our great privilege to respond with praise and thanksgiving. Taking our cue, perhaps, from that one leper, falling at the feet of Jesus, praising God, knowing the one to thank. Martin Luther captures this idea of the response, a response to the giver for gifts given, in his second, the meaning of the second article of the Apostles' Creed. In that meaning, Luther says, for all this, it is our duty to thank and praise and serve and obey Him. Or, as we prayed in our Thanksgiving prayer earlier in the service, grant us, Lord, Your Holy Spirit, that we may acknowledge Your goodness, give thanks for Your benefits, and serve You in willing obedience all our days. And when in sin we find that we have forgotten such things. Take comfort. Take comfort in your God who has found you when you sought him not. He has not forgotten his promise. And so he has not forgotten you. Thank you, God, for such mercy. When looking at the Thanksgiving display, you may have noticed eight pots of flowers surrounding the perimeter of the display, almost like a frame. They're mums, I believe. I don't really know too many flowers, but I think I know that. I think they're mums, and I'm getting some nods. Yes, so that's good. Mums, I believe, eight pots of flowers. And so what's my point? Flowers, especially living flowers, are, of course, a sign of life. Eight in the Bible and in Christian history is often a sign of the new creation, new life that we have in Jesus alone. Our baptismal font has eight sides. Eight sides pointing to the truth that in baptism, through the water and the word of God, the Holy Spirit works to bring faith in Jesus and his promises. The Holy Spirit works to wash away all our sins, to bring us forgiveness, to bring new life as the baptized person dies and rises in Christ as a new creation. Eight pots of flowers surround the perimeter of our thanksgiving display of physical and material blessings of body and soul. And we then come to see and believe more firmly that as Christians, the one who gives shape and meaning to our lives of praise and thanksgiving here on earth is indeed Jesus, his gift of new life, his manger, his cross, his empty tomb, his forgiveness, his eternal life and salvation given in grains of wheat and the fruit of the vine a life of praise and thanksgiving as new creations in Christ. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Please stand. <clears throat> the peace of God that surpasses all human understanding, keep your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus, our Lord.